<clears throat> okay. Should be. Let's give this a try. All right. Hi, everyone. We're going to try to get this started. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of feedback, but that's okay. It's recording. Um, well, that, welcome. Thank you for coming. And I'm going to do a quick uh, intro of Vicky as well as just a couple announcements. Um, one of the announcements that we have is that if you saw, um, William Bernhardt is going to be offering a writer's workshop on August 14th and it's free it's open to the first 60 registrations and so if you go on to the enid writers club website you can print out the form and then send it in mail it in um, and the first 60 get to go to the workshop it's pretty cool all day in enid at a gorgeous mansion lunch is provided um, so come out and hang out with us uh, really quickly Congratulations to all the winners from OWFI's literary contest. We have a lot of award-winning authors in here, which is really, really cool. Um, so please share your, your good news at the end of our meeting today. And then now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our guest speaker, Vicki. Um, Vicki Malone Kennedy um, is, gonna get, or is going to speak today on story structure. And she is the winner of the first place in genre fiction in the 85th annual Writer's Digest competition a Daryl Award for Best Mid-South Short Story and an OWFI Crème, Crème de la Crème Award. So the presentation today is gonna to be about 60 minutes and then after that, we'll do Q&A. So with that, welcome. Come in there. Hi guys, I hope I can figure this out. Um, Briefly about myself, as Amy said, I've won a couple of awards, uh, a couple of really nice awards. Uh, one of my proudest awards was just recently at OWFI. I won the uh, um, Honorary Lifetime Membership Award, which I've been working for for a long time. Um, I, I told everybody at OWFI after I won the award, uh, Lifetime Membership Award. When I started at OWFI over 20 something years ago, and we're not really sure exactly how many years ago, I know that I was a member of OWFI in 2000. I was president in 2005, but I started somewhere between 1995 and 1998, the exact year. I can't remember. I'm not that organized. What can I say? But when I first started, I had goals set for myself. I wanted to win anything, <laughs> even an honorable mention. And it took me a long time to do that. It really did. I, it took me lo much longer to win an honorable mention than I thought it should. But we have extremely good competition in OWFI. We've got some very, very talented writers. And so if you enter an OWFI contest category and you don't win for many years, do not be discouraged. You're competing with the best of the best. My second goal, of course, was to win first place, which I finally did. Win creme de la creme, which I finally did. Uh, being president was one of my goals, which I did pretty quickly. Being a speaker was one of my goals, which I finally did. And of course, winning the creme de la creme, I mean, the um, Oh, did I say the Crim de la Crim already? I did. I won that. And of course, winning the honorary lifetime membership was another one. Now, my next and final OW goal is to be keynote speaker, guys. So let's make that happen sometime before I get too old and decrepit to get up on stage. I've had several short stories published in print and online. Um, I have yet to have a full length novel published because I primarily write short fiction. I can finish short fiction. I'm lazy by nature and it takes me way too long to finish a novel. I've got novels that I've been working on for decades and they're not finished yet, but I can finish short fiction. I can finish short fiction reasonably quickly. So short fiction is a good way to go to hone your skills and, and get your talents out there and get things published and get started while you're still working on that 20 year novel. And so 
don't don't overlook short fiction. I write primarily science fiction, paranormal romance, fantasy, and erotica. Good. I write erotica under a lot of different pen names for two reasons. One, uh, I also taught Sunday school, and I'm an ordained minister. <laughs> and, uh, and and the second reason, of course, is it is not safe to write erotica under your own name. You get some really bad quacks. You get you get stopped. So anyway. Now that's enough about me personally. We'll get on to the actual uh, presentation if I can share this screen. Uh, that didn't do it. Oh, oh, okay, wait a minute. I think what I need to do is go here first. Uh, I may need some help here, Amy. Okay. Yep, let's see. Oh, you are sharing your screen already. Is it? Yeah, you're sharing your screen. Okay, so. You're good. Oh, it's it's there? Yep. Okay. Well, you'll always be there because that's from your computer. Right, but it's yeah. on ours, right? Yep. Yes, I can see it now. You are sharing, okay. so. Because I didn't think I could see this part. Um, slideshow, resume slideshow. There we go. Let's see if that takes me where I need to go. All right, y'all can see that right on your screen. Okay, this is story building blocks, the ABCs of story structure. I have given this presentation several times. This is a little bit newer. A little. I've got. I've added a few things, taken away a few things. Um, uh, it didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Somebody else that knows more about this than I do. Okay, it says new share. That's why I'm doing it wrong, I think. We can see your screen. So go ahead and close that. Oh, okay. And just go back there. Go back there. Yep. And then you can go to this, um, this one right here. That one? Yeah. That didn't work. I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, yeah, we got from the beginning. Oh, maybe it needs no. And then we should be able to. Because it's not sh moving on. Yeah. When I try to move on, it's not moving on here. Resume slideshow. Let me try this. You can just go down because when you go down, we'll see it. Right now, we're gonna, we're seeing your whole desktop. Okay. Never mind. So you can go back to your. Oh crap. Go to more. And then um, resume share. Resume okay. share. There you go. And All then right. maximize that. Maximize that. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then you can just click through the slides. But see, it's not clicking through here. That's okay. We can it, see it. You can see it on your screen. Um, but they can. You, what do you see on your screen? Are you seeing this? All right. That was the slideshow. Why is it not showing as a slideshow? I don't know. That's so weird. Huh. I messed it up. I am so sorry. All right. So for those of who are in the room, if you can, I would just log on to Zoom and mute yourself, and you can follow the slides through. The Except Zoom. that it's it's not. I don't know why not, the projector is not showing your slideshow. Okay, but that's not what I want them to see, though. Ah, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There. Nope. It didn't work. Yeah, but they're not seeing it at all. 
Dang it, dang it, dang it. Ah, maybe that's it. Yay. Look at that, she figured it out. All right, I'm not touching anything else. <laughs> okay, uh, I already told you about myself. Uh, that's my email. My website is just vickymalonekennedy.com. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today is the building blocks of, of story structure and all stories are the same. No matter what kind of story you're writing, no matter um, how long or short the story is, they're all the same and I'll explain how in just a minute. We're gonna talk about every story has a beginning, a middle and an end. And we're gonna talk about crafting a three act story structure in 15 easy steps. And actually I can boil it down to even less than that. All right, all stories are the same. Every single story ever written has to have a protagonist. The protagonist wants something. He, there has to be an antagonist and the antagonist wants something and whatever the antagonist wants directly interferes with whatever the protagonist wants. The antagonist is there to prevent the protagonist from getting what they want. Now, what that means is that your antagonist does not necessarily have to be a human. It can be a circumstance. It can be a problem. Uh, it can be a blizzard. It can be uh, a shipwreck. Your antagonist, it can be a whale. You know, your antagonist does not have to be human. Well, your protagonist doesn't either. It can be Wally. You know, it can be a robot. It can be, but the protagonist is basically the hero, the good guy, the main character, and the antagonist is the villain, the evil character, the bad guy, or whatever prevents the protagonist from getting what he wants or they want. And in the end, only one of them can actually get what they want. Now, throughout the story, they may swap off. The protagonist may get what he wants for a little while, and the antagonist may get what they want for a little while. It may go back and forth, back and forth, but in the end, only one of them can actually win. Only one of them can actually get what they want. In chess, there's only one winner. Unless, of course, it's a tie. You know, what do they call that? They don't call it a tie in chess. A draw. The protagonist, that's my, my little granddaughter. And uh, she's so cute. She's much older and much bigger now. Want, get uh, The protagonist wants something. It looks like she wants a violin here, right? And, uh, but I just threw that in because she's cute and she's the good guy. They want something. They either want the gold, the glory, or the guy or the girl. That is exactly what every single character wants. They either want fame, fortune, money, love. Of course, then you got to throw in vengeance. There's always that want too. But those are the three main wants. The glory, the gold, the girl or the guy. The antagonist, guess what? He wants the money, the gold, the glory, and in Dingen's case, all the girls. <laughs> and the antagonist, if the antagonist wants exactly the same thing that the protagonist wants, it makes for good conflict. The antagonist has to prevent the protagonist from getting what he really wants until the very end of the story. And if the protagonist gets what he wants in the middle of the story, well, your story's over. Sorry, that's where you end it. When the protagonist gets what he wants, you're at the end of the story. You just got to tie up a few less, loose ends. It shouldn't be more than a chapter or two if you're writing a book. And a page if you're writing a short story. In the end, only one of them can win. There can be only one. Now, conflict is what, sto what every story is really all about. That's why every story is the same too. It's because conflict is the important part of the story. If there's no conflict, the story is dull, it's boring, it's over, you're wasting your reader's time. So that's why your antagonist is always working against your protagonist to keep the protagonist to get what he wants. That's what causes conflict in your story. But sometimes your good guy and your bad guy want exactly the same thing, or they're both good to a certain point and they're both bad to a certain point. And sometimes the only way you can tell the difference between the good guy and the bad guy is by the line that they will not cross. The hero will kill to protect. He'll do anything to protect him. His friends, his family, total strangers. 
Sometimes he'll sacrifice himself instead of fighting back, but not until the end, because he's if he sacrifices himself in the beginning, it's over, it's done. Yeah, well, but he's not dead yet. <laughs> now, the bad, now he'll do anything. <laughs> yeah, like he'll it. he will do anything because he wants to kill that you know what carol baskins but he won't cross the line of he doesn't hurt the pets he doesn't hurt the animals the bad guy will kill mutilate murder wipe out entire villages kill every woman child in the in the village but he'll leave the dog he won't he won't kick the dog because once he crosses that line well <laughs> Let's face it, we all want him dead at that point. We hate him from then on, and there's no hope for him whatsoever, right? Now, every single character in your story wants something, even if it's only a glass of water. Every character has some sort of conflict. It can be small, it can be quick, it can be minor, but even your minor character should want something. The maid wants a day off. Uh, the chauffeur wants a date with the princess everybody in your story has to want something you don't have to make a big issue of, out of it you don't have to give us 20 pages on what they want but that every single character should want something and every story has to have at least one character that everybody roots for no matter what now i don't know if any of you have seen deadpool he claims he's not a hero he's actually an assassin for hire he, he used to be in the military. Now he's an assassin for hire. But we love him. And we love him for a lot of reasons. And the number one reason that we love him is because he has been done wrong. He has been mistreated. He was sick, ill, had cancer, goes for treatment, goes to get well because of the love of his girlfriend. There we go. We've got the one of the girl, right? And it turns out terribly, terribly bad. And now he wants to kill the bad guys, but we still love him. He's funny and he's good and everybody can root for him. Every story is about something. I know that's kind of childish, isn't it? But no, a lot of people forget that one little fact. Your story has to be about something. And if you're going to write about something, make it important, make it life-changing make it world-changing yes you can write a small little quiet story about a little old lady wanting to go to town and you can make that exciting and you can make that interesting it's not life-changing for anybody but the little old lady maybe if she gets hit by a car on her way to town um, but you can still make a story out of that but don't bore your readers, don't waste their time, give them something interesting, give them a story they want to read, give them a story they want to read more than once. And the best way to do that is to make it life changing, not only for the character, but for everybody in the story and make it important. All right, now we're getting to the actual story structure part of the program, be the beginning of every story. I pulled out some first liners from some books and this happens to be one of my favorites. Uh, it doesn't really matter where you write, just write. You can write in the kitchen sink. Now that's, are you interested in finding out about that story now? Why is this person sitting in the, in the kitchen sink? But it doesn't matter where you write. You need a comfortable place. Where to begin the story? Um, Shandy wrote, I begin with writing the first sentence and trust to Almighty God for the second. And that is true in almost every writer's life. You may, even if you're a very um, organized planner, you really have to trust that that second sentence, that first sentence is going to come. Now, here's the secret. You don't have to keep the first sentence you start with. Wait till the end of the book and then go back and rewrite the, the first couple of paragraphs because you, something that's going to happen in that book somewhere along the line, even if you're a great planner and thought you had everything planned out perfectly, somewhere in the book, that first line is going to come to you. So don't worry about the first line in the beginning. Now, I like this one here. A story has no beginning or end. I just got through telling you every story has a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
This is completely opposite of that. But the reason is, is because every story chooses that moment of where the story starts, either to look back on the history or to go forward in the history. So the best place to start any story is in the middle. Aha, the beginning is in the middle. When I say the best place to start is in the middle, I mean in the middle of the action, in the middle of what's going on, in the middle of the adventure. Now you want to start in the middle, you want to start the beginning of the story in the middle, so you've got to start by introducing characters and introducing things, but introduce them doing something, introduce them not six days before the action starts, not six years before the action starts. Start as close to the end as possible. And uh, now, Kurt Vonnegut said this. I'm a big fan of Kurt Vonnegut's. I actually got to meet him once for about three seconds. Uh, he came out on stage. He was a little tiny, frazzled little old man. He had to have help to walk to the podium. And when he got to the podium, he became so energetic and so charismatic. And he gave us an hour of absolute energy. And then he stumbled off the stage again with help. So, but he always said, start as close to the end as possible. I said, start in the middle. So your middle close to the end and backstory belongs well on the back burner, not at the beginning of the story. I know a lot of people start their stories that with a lot of backstory, try to avoid that. If you can backstory is boring. I'm sorry. I've never read a book ever that had backstory at the beginning of the book that was interesting. If you want to tell us what happened before, tell us later. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? But it works, it truly works. I am currently reading a book that I really am enjoying the book, but it took 45 pages to get to the story. There's 40 pages of backstory. Backstory belongs in the middle. Now, there are planners those people who have to have every single thing plotted out, planned out, organized, have graphs before they ever write a work. And that's cool if that's what you do. I can't do that. But planners, they're like bakers who use a recipe. They know they don't throw the ingredients in willy nilly. They follow the recipe. They follow the directions. And then they come out with this beautiful, beautiful artwork. Then there are pantsers. And those are the people who just sit down and start writing and have no idea what they're writing about or where it's going or how they're gonna get there. And that's cool too, because that works. Uh, it doesn't mean that it won't be good. It might mean that it's not as organized. It may take you longer to get where you're going and it may take you longer to get organized. It's probably one of the reasons I've never finished an entire novel. <laughs> So you still might get a cake that's good to eat if you're not following the recipe. Now, my grandmother, I never saw her use a recipe in her life, but when she died, I inherited this ton of recipes and I recognized every single one of them. Basically what she did is she used the recipe once, she followed the recipe once, and then from then on, she just added, she knew what went in it and she put it in there. She didn't measure, she didn't measure the flour, she didn't measure the sugar. She threw a pinch of this, a pinch of that. She came out with beautiful, wonderful, delicious food every single time. Uh, but again, if you don't follow the recipe, then you still might end up with a good cake that's fit to eat, but it might be a little sloppy. This happened. I'm a planter. Now, basically what a planter means is that I don't write in a linear procession. I have an idea. Most people write, uh, or if you write in a linear procession, you write in a straight line from the beginning to the end. I don't do that. I write a scene here, I write a scene there, I write a scene over here, I write a scene over here. I write this scene over here and then I go, oh, wait a minute. I need to write that back there. A lot of my stories come from dreams, which means that in a lot of ways, they, I've got the whole story. Although sometimes I've only got one little line from that dream. I remember one little scene. So I write them out as fast as I can. I put them down on paper. I don't worry about spelling. I don't worry about grammar. I don't worry about format. I just write down everything I can remember as fast as I can. And then I go back later and put it into a structured 
format. Now I told you 15 easy steps, well, Pixar narrowed it down even less than that. Pixar's wonderful story structure is once upon a time there was a hero, your good guy, the lead character. And every single day he did exactly the same thing over and over and over, the ant rolling the ball up the hill, every day up the hill, every day up the hill, until one day something happens that changes everything. Well, maybe the ball rolls back down on top of the ant, right? But whatever it is that changes everything, the hero now has to make some decisions. Because of things changing, because of that inciting in incident, that catalyst, the hero now has to make changes in his life. He has to, be to debate what he's gonna do. And because he's debating what he's gonna do, then he's gotta make a choice, he's gotta make a decision. And because he makes a choice and a decision, then he has to change his everyday thing to something new. He has to take a new action and do something completely new. And when he does that something new, the stakes are raised. And when the stakes are raised, the bad guys come in and try to take over. And when the bad guys come in, everything goes crazy. It's total chaos. And eventually at some point at, when the bad guys are taking over and the bad guys are chasing him all over the place, something terrible happens. Something really horrible happens. He loses somebody he loves or he almost loses somebody he loves, whatever happens, he completely, totally gives up. This is it, I can't go any farther. I'm not gonna be able to, I'm not gonna be able to get what I want. I'm not gonna be able to achieve my goal. I'm gonna quit. But the hero can't quit. The heroes aren't quitters, are they? So he has to pick himself up, dust himself off and take charge of the situation and go after the bad guys. So now it's another chase scene, but in the opposite direction. And the hero goes after the bad guys and he defeats them one by one, the, the minions first. <laughs> My guys are going first. <laughs> sorry, Nick, sorry, HB. Yeah, they're going first. And then he finally gets to the, the main bad guy, defeats the main ba bad guy. And once the bad guy is defeated, then it's happily ever after. Now. If the bad guy wins and the hero loses, everybody dies. There are really basically only two ends to every story. Happily ever after, everybody dies. <laughs> you got no other choices. I mean, yeah, you do, but those are the main ones. I mean, and then that's the end. Now, that's pretty easy. That's pretty quick. I gave those of you here a little card with that information on it. Uh, and on the back one side, on one side, it's got the um, uh, good guy wants something that and uh, those of you who are not here, if you want to email me, you can email me. I'll send you a copy. All right. Crafting a three act story structure in 15 easy steps. Now, I just told you Pixar's easy steps and there's less than 15 of those. But a guy named Blake Snyder. He wrote this wonderful book called Save the Cat. And Save the Cat is originally written for movie scripts, but it is the best, absolutely best writing resource I have ever read. And believe me, I've read thousands. And this one is the best one. And he breaks it down. He breaks it down into a 15 step outline that you can use for any story, long or short, good or bad, script or novel, short story, it doesn't matter. You can use this for every story you ever write. And it's basically the outline, guys. Act one, you have the opening image, the theme, the setup, the catalyst, the debate, and the break into act two. And that's 25% of your story. The first 25% of your story, that's what needs to be included in it. Act two, you have the B story, the fun and games, the midpoint, the bad guys close in, the all is lost moment, the darkest moment and break into act three. Now that's the middle of your story. That's the hardest part of any story to write. And it's also the longest, that's 50% of your story. No matter how long your story is, if it's, it's a 10 page story, if it's 300 page story, 50% of your story is act two, the middle. 
And act three, act three moves pretty fast. That's the finale, the final image. And it's another 25% of your story. So the beginning is 25, the end is 25, and the middle is 50. That's where we all need to work the hardest, right? All right. I already told you Save the Cat was written as a guide for screenwriters. In screenwriting, each page is approximately, each page of script is approximately one minute on film. And the average book length is somewhere around 300 to 400 words. So since Blake pay, numbered the pages of what needs to happen on which pages, I kind of went ahead and figured out for a 300 page book, what page in the book it needs to be. And I put that in parentheses on here. The beginning, act one, page one. Once upon a time, there was a hero, a good guy. Introduce your good guy as quickly as possible. Uh, and introduce him by name or them by name. I should not say him. I should, I should be more neutral, gender neutral. Um, introduce your hero by name. Don't wait till page 40 to tell us what the hero's name is. We want to know who we're investing our time and energy in. I will tell you this, whoever is the first person mentioned in your story, that's the first person that your reader will invest themselves in. If that person dies on page two, your reader was already invested in that person. Now they've got to invest themselves in somebody else. So if you can Introduce your hero on the first page. Introduce them on the first paragraph. If you can work it out, introduce them in the first sentence. Call me Ishmael. Well, he wasn't really the, the main character, was he? But he was the narrator. So, all right. Now, set the tone, the mood, the type, and the scope of the story. All right. I love Jane Austen. Now here's a woman that just writes so beautifully, you can get lost. And her, in the opening sentence of, of Pride and Prejudice is, it's a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. You immediately know what's gonna happen in this story. You got a rich guy who's single and he's gotta want a wife, right? Well, not really. Darcy didn't really want a wife, he wasn't really looking for a wife. He was quite content in his solitude. He didn't even really want a wife once he met Elizabeth, but he fell in love with her and he wanted her then. So there's what he wanted. But what really is going on in this story is that Elizabeth's mother wants a husband for her daughters. And this is what the story is really about the search for husbands for her daughters. So obviously if there's a rich guy in the neighborhood, he's got to want a wife and he's got to want one of my kids. Now, Elizabeth Bennett is the main character and the story is told from her point of view and, and they do introduce her pretty quickly in the story, but there's a sea of characters. There's a thousand characters in this story and they all get introduced really, really fast. If you've got a thousand characters in your story, try really hard to introduce them one at a time. And uh, I mean, yes, you walk into a room and everybody's sitting at the dining room table, but let us get to know each character one at a time. Now, set the scope of the story. I love this book, 1984. It's one of my favorites. The opening line, it was a bright, cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. Now, if that's not ominous, what is, right? That certainly sets the, 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 the scope of that book. You know that this is going to be something completely different. The clocks don't strike 13, that ain't right. So what is right? What's gonna happen next? The theme of the story, someone in the story not the hero, poses a question or makes a statement, usually to the hero, that states the theme of the story. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. There's the theme of Spider-Man. Use the force. That's the theme of Star Wars. Every story has a theme. Now, I'm not good with themes. I don't know what the theme is half the time. I finished the story and I still don't know what the theme is. But 
if your story doesn't have a theme, then you're missing something. So even if you finish and you've not got no theme, go back, read it, set it back and look at it and see if you can figure out the theme. Remember the story I told you about that it took 45 minutes for me, or 40 pages for me to actually, for the story to actually start. The name of the book has blood in the title. And in the first chapter, there is all this symbolism of blood. There's all this red, red paint, red lipstick, red dresses, red everywhere. So we know that blood is a theme in this story. I mean, there's no question, no doubt whatsoever that blood is a serious theme in this story. So look at your story closely, see what things are repeated, see what symbolism is there, find your theme. The setup, every day, the hero does the same old thing. So you start your story in the hero's normal, average, everyday world, what's going on in that world. I showed the picture of the surfer. Okay, you start the story with him surfing and then he gets attacked by a shark. That's yeah. Uh-oh, am I running it? When I there dying to familiar. Um, somebody, when somebody, I made meat before, I always thought we broiled them. Somebody meet your meet your deal. Okay. Uh, this is where you set up the stakes and the goals of the story, and you introduce or hint to the other main characters in the story. Um, the A characters and the B characters. Your A characters are your main characters, your B characters are your supporting characters. The A story is the main plot. The B story is the subplot. If you're going to write a full-length novel, you got to have at least one good subplot. In this part of the story, it's nice, it's calm, everything's quiet, it's, things are going along just fine. You're just getting to know your character and what is normal to everyday life is, is like. Now, while you're getting to know your character, you're going to get to know that he's got some flaws, he's got some ticks. There are things that happen over and over again. You know, his best friends, ha there's a running gag or two, at least. In Alice in Wonderland, they introduce, they set up the, the real world, the everyday. She's on the grass at, at, the, at the park by the riverside. Bored, bored, bored. But just because Alice is bored does not mean your reader needs to be bored. And Alice lets you know that she's bored because there's nothing to do. And her sister's reading a boring book. So what's going to happen? Alice is going to wander off, right? I mean, there it is right there at the very beginning. She's going to wander away because she's bored. But she's going to wander away, not because she's bored, but to keep you from being bored, to keep the reader from being bored. You set up the stakes and the goals. I have not read this book. I found this line, this op opening line online, and I thought, man, I want to read this book. Because here, you, the stakes and the goals. Every summer, Lin Kong returned to Goose Village to divorce his wife. Oh, now, that means that this guy has been married to her more than once, divorced her more than once, does it every summer. Why? I want to know. I want to know. He, there's, the goals are set. The stakes are set. There's going to be a divorce. Or is there? Maybe this summer they'll work it out. You know. And I said earlier, introduce your hint, your A characters, but try not to introduce them all in the first paragraph. I'm lost. I'm already lost. Try not to, to introduce a thousand characters in the first paragraph. I see my friend Lisa is on here. And so I will use her as an example. Lisa has this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful science fiction space opera story. And it's a saga. There's like five books in a row. And she's got thousands of characters, thousands. And I have read the first book a hundred times at least because I helped her with it. And I'm gonna tell you, that even I can't remember all the characters. <laughs> so yes, if you have a thousand characters, that's okay. But try not to introduce them all at one time and try to let us get to know each one. And every character has its flaws. It can be a little flaw. It can be a big flaw. It can be annoying, but he's got to have at least a couple of flaws. Flaws add to his character. They add come uh, to the story. They help make things more interesting. And of course, 
eventually he's got to overcome a few of those flaws. The events in the story, he's going to have to step up and overcome some of his flaws. Now, the protagonist must do something early, early in the story. During the setup, before the catalyst, before the big event that changes everything, show the protagonist do something that endures him to your reader. Something that makes him lovable, something that makes him sweet, even if he's a pain in the you know what before. Do something that makes him enduring to your reader and proves to your reader that he has what it takes deep down to become a hero. In Save, a, Save the Cat, Blake this says to have your character save the cat. And if he can't, save the cat or save something, save somebody, save the animal, save the, the girl from the burning building. He needs to save something, rescue something. And if he can't rescue something or someone, then at least let him kiss the babies. You know, let him be sweet to his nieces and nephews. Let him be, you know, let him do something nice for a kid. Because guess what? Everybody loves it when you're good to kids and, and animals, right? You become the good guy immediately. Even the bad guy can be nice to kids, though, so. All right, the catalyst. One day something terrible happens. Well, it doesn't have to be terrible, terrible, but it's something that causes a major change in the hero's world. Something that is going to make him have to take some sort of action, leave the safety and the comfort of his home life and his regular everyday life, and move on into a whole new area that he never would have thought of going into before. Now, plug I'll, uh, this shameless plug, I won OWFI creme de la creme with a Western novel. Now, what did I tell you in the beginning, what I write? Science fiction, fantasy, paranormal romance, erotica. Never wrote, fic never wrote Western before. So basically went out of my comfort zone. This is what happens, happens here. Something happens that moves your hero out of his comfort zone. And this is also a very good place to, to introduce your antagonist because, well, the antagonist is usually the cause of the catalyst that moves your hero out of his comfort zone. There's a lot of chaos and craziness going on here. A lot of shock and denial. Now, this whole presentation used to all be about Star Wars because I'm a big Star Wars fan. I, I kind of cut out a little bit of it, but yeah, here you go. Now we're entering the Star Wars phase. In Star Wars, this is the major catalyst. This is the turning point. This is the major event, the inc inciting incident. When Luke Skywalker discovers Princess Leia pleading for help. Help me, Obi-Wan Obi -Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. But guess what? This is a repetition. We've already seen this exact scene of her making that video at the beginning of the story. I used to wonder why Star Wars waited for so long to introduce Luke because Luke is the main character. But guess what? When George Lucas originally wrote Star Wars, Leia was the main character. She was the hero of the story. The producers and the studios wouldn't let him do it because at that particular time, that strong female character was not popular. These days, if they make a remake of Star Wars, which I hope they don't because I hate remakes, but if they did and they told the story the way Lucas originally planned it, Leia would be the main character, the hero. And so the catalyst begins with her. The inciting incident actually begins at the beginning of the movie with her. But this is where the inciting incident starts for Luke. This is where Luke's world changes. The minute he lays eyes on that woman, he wants her. She's his sister. <laughs> Spoiler alert. He doesn't know that till like the second or third movie. I can't remember when he finds out second movie. And, but still, the minute he lays eyes on her, he wanted her. All right, now the hero has to debate what he's going to do. He has to decide whether or not he's going to take action. He ha always has to refuse at first. Come on. If he decides to jump right in, both feet first and dive in head first into the deep end, it's too easy. He's got to think about it, at least for a page or a sentence or two, you know. 
He's got to go, oh, this is a bad idea. Ah, I got to do it anyway. It's a bad idea. I'm going to get in trouble if I go after this girl, if I try to go get rescue her. But hey, God, she is beautiful. I want her. Let's go. And uh, so, of course, Luke goes and talks it over with Obi-Wan Kenobi because he's the one that she really wants. And he also has to go through that. I'm not, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. But he convinces himself to go out. And then you break into two. I haven't been mentioning it, but if you notice the little pages up there, when it says 25 or 75, in Blake Snyder's Save the Cat, he suggests that this actually has to happen by this page or on this page of the script. So if there's only one page number on there, then that's what that means. He, according to Blake, this, ha this is where this has to happen in the story. If it doesn't happen by this point, I don't know what's going to happen. Your story's going to go to all of you know where. But the hero can't be lured. He has to make the choice. He has to make the decision himself to move on in. Now, Kurt Vonnegut, I told you I'm a fan. He was cool. One of his favorite comments was, be a sadist. No matter how sweet or innocent your good guy, your hero, your protagonist might be put them through the mill every single thing that can happen that can go bad should go bad for this person i mean everything should go bad they should lose their dog lose their farm their parents should run away from home everything bad should happen to them. as much as you can get so that if the hero had the more obstacles the hero has to overcome the better person they are <laughs> Isn't it terrible that we have to go through tragedy and sadness and misery to become decent human beings? But that's the way it has to be for your hero, for your protagonist. May, give them give them obstacles as many obstacles as possible. Now, when I say as many obstacles as possible, you don't want three hundred obstacles in their way. It's like a thousand characters. You know, be picky, be choosy, but make it make it tough. Don't make it easy. Never make it easier easy on your character easy is boring we don't want to bore the readers something major happens in this case luke's family is murdered so now luke is like you know this is kind of a mixed blessing for luke he didn't want to leave the farm because he owed, felt like he owed something to his uncle but now he's free but guess what freedom is a tough choice free it's not easy being free. It's not easy being green. It's not easy being free. All right, now we come to the middle, act two, the middle. Act two is kind of like everything slows down a little bit. You had to, first you got to know the character, then something terrible happens to the character. And now you slow down just a little bit and find out a little bit more about the character. And this is where the backstory can go in. You know, you don't want to dump it again in there in one spot. Backstory is like, um, um, what's those really hot peppers? The Yes. It's like putting a really hot pepper in your chili. Everybody loves hot chili, but you don't want it to be too hot. Just a little bit. And then a little here and a little there. Let everybody season a little bit at a time. You don't want too much backstory. I know a lot of people write an entire book. It's backstory. And a lot of famous popular books are backstory, backstory, backstory. But guess what? Those books that have 45 pages of backstory, they were popular in the 1900s, in the early 1900s. They are not popular today. We live in a fast food society. We live in an internet society. We live in flash fiction times. People want to know what's happening to the character right now and from here on. They don't really care that much about his past. Now, if something happens in your story that relates to something that happened before, that's a good place to put the backstory. You know, they can remember, oh, I've had this experience before, but they don't need to dwell on it. It doesn't need to be long. Backstory doesn't have to be long. It can be very, very brief. This is where you introduce new characters. 
new adventures and new love stories. Now, your hero, your protagonist, and the guy girl that they're after, they can't be the only love story in your story. Now, maybe in a short story, but not in a novel. So they meet new friends, and then there's fun and games. You make new friends, what do you do? You play, you have a good time. You learn new games, you learn new tricks, you learn new trades, you learn new talents. And of course, if you're gonna have new friends, you're also gonna have some conflict with your new friends. Don't forget to put that conflict in. And then of course, your hero is get, has to be prepared for the challenges that he's got to meet farther on. So he's got to learn new skills. He's got to try those new skills out and he's got to fail a little bit. He can't just be great at everything. I mean, I know, yeah. Um, Daryl's great at everything, but you know, and he's got to, can't be great at everything. Can't win every single time. He's got to have some trials, some failures, and some victories. And then we come to the midpoint of the story. We're still in the middle of the story, guys. <laughs> and uh, um, the, all of a sudden, something happens that the fun and the games end immediately. Your hero gets attacked. Uh, the bad guys come in. Uh, there's a dynamic change in the story. Um, the stakes are raised. This is a point in the story that is a false high or low. And uh, either something really good happens, but it's not the best thing that could happen. Or something really bad happens, but it's not the worst. We haven't got to the worst yet. And uh, so the girl goes missing. Or he meets the girl. Or he meets a new girl. But something good happens or something bad happens. Things change again in the story. In Star Wars, of course, it was when they finally met Leia. This is next comes the bad guys closing in. Lots of chase scenes, chaos, total insanity. Keep it going. Keep it active. Don't bore your reader. Trials and tests and tribulations, sacrifices, everybody is uh, all the upheaval you can imagine in the world. This is where the protagonist starts to doubt his sidekick. The good, the other guys that are around him, maybe somebody's a traitor. Maybe somebody has infiltrated his group to, to uh, give him away or, to the antagonist. So there's doubt, there's fear. Bad guys are closing in. And then, of course, comes the all is lost moment. This is opposite of the high and low moment. So if you had a good cheery moment over here, then this one's a bad one. If you had a really bad one over here, this one is bad too, but it's worse. It's worse, worse, worse. This is where you get the whiff of death. Somebody either almost dies or does die. In um, Star Wars, of course, this is where Obi-Wan Kenobi bites the dust. It's the darkest moment for Luke. It's the darkest moment for your character. It's the, oh my God, why have thou, hast thou forsaken me moment? And uh, every character needs to go through this. You know, now you're sitting there thinking, well, what if I'm writing a comedy? Even in a comedy, your character must have that moment where everything feels like it's lost because then it can pick back up again. It can cheer back up again. But if it's just 100% comedy all the way through, that gets kind of boring. Here's the, here's the key. If you do anything the same from beginning to end, it gets boring. You've got to have change. You've got to have conflict. Conflict is the key. Conflict is the thing you need in every story. And conflict comes from one person wanting something or, and one person preventing them from getting it. Constant conflict throughout your story. Then you break into act three and this is where your storylines meet up. If you've got something going on in the beginning and something else going on in the middle, this is where everything finally comes together. The hero has learned his new skills. He's passed all his tests. Um, his mentor has died. He's gone through his darkest moment. 
And he's got to dig deep, deep, deep to find the strength, the courage, the power to take over, take charge, and win the day. Sometimes he has to have a plan. Ha -ha. You know, we go back to the plant pantsers and the plan and and the planners. To win the day, the hero has to have a plan. That means that as a writer, you have to have a plan, right? You have to know what's going on and how to fix it. That's always the hard part too. And then act three, fast, fast, fast. The chaos goes, everybody's chasing everybody. The, you, have the, you get rid of the, all the bad guys one at a time. The hero comes out in the lead uh, and he destroys the ultimate evil, the antagonist, whatever's preventing him from getting what he wants throughout the story. And because he's defeated whatever it is that has been preventing him from getting what he wants throughout the story, well then, we have to clean things up, put things back together. The empire has been in a shambles, but now we can clean it up. We've destroyed the Death Star. We can clean up the empire and get things straightened up. We have the final image, the last part of the story, the end of the story. Everybody in it, everybody's happy. It's happily ever after. Or everybody dies. You know, yeah. everybody dies. And if your hero is going to die, then this this spot back here, um, the until finally change has occurred. Well, that this is where your hero dies. As close, if your hero's dying, let your hero die as close to the end as possible. Remember, begin as close as to the end as possible. That doesn't necessarily mean begin with the hero dying, but you can begin with somebody dying. Every scene, every chapter is a mini story. Every scene, every chapter has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now, you don't have to go through things as intensely as the whole over arc of the story, but every scene, every chapter of the story has to be a little mini story in itself. Somebody wants something, somebody's preventing them from, from getting it, they get it or they don't get it. These are the areas where your main character can get what he wants part of the time and lose the other part of the time. And it doesn't prevent him from winning in the end. Um, and every scene has to have, every scene, chapter, scenes and chapters, basically the same thing, has to have some kind of theme. And, but the, the theme of each, chapter should build toward the overall theme of the story. And this is where you find your theme sometimes is by building the chapters, one chapter at a time. And every scene, the protagonist wants something. And every scene should end on a high or a low. Something good happens at the end of the chapter or something bad happens at the end of the chapter. Now, here's the trick. Every chapter has to be a mini story and every chapter has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you want, but you want the ending of every chapter to lead you toward the next chapter. You want to go on. You don't want to stop. You don't want to end the story in that at the end of chapter five. So chapter five can must have its own ending, but it has to have an ending that leads you to the next chapter. Keeps you from saying, oh, I'm done. Kill your little darlings. And uh, electrocute them in the shower, bury them in the backyard. Every sentence, every sentence must do one of two things reveal character or advance the action. Man, that gets tough. That's a lot of work. I got to work on every single sentence. I got to make every single sentence in this story count. This is why I write short stories. Because it's hard to make every single sentence in a story count, but it has to. You can't bore your reader if it's boring, if it doesn't reveal character, if it doesn't advance the action, get rid of it. Edit it, cut it, throw it away. You don't need it and your reader doesn't want it. And then once again, if you don't, if you didn't, listen to a word I had to say, if I bored you for the last hour and whatever, if you didn't learn a single thing from me, this is the most important thing of all. 
The protagonist wants something. The antagonist wants something that interferes with the protagonist getting what they want. And in the end, only one of them can actually get what they really want. If you don't remember anything else, that alone will help you improve your writing and your story structure. If you remember that every chapter, the protagonist wants something. Somebody in every chapter wants something. And the whole point of every chapter and the entire point of the entire book is finding a way to keep that protagonist from getting what they want. And by the end of the book, finding a way for him to get what he wants. And if you can do that, well, guess what? You can be a best-selling author, which someday I hope I to be. Again, that's my information. If you want to contact me, if you want copies of anything. And now, yes, questions. You reminded me of something that I just read. It's kind of convoluted because it's written by a psychoanalyst. It's called the Big Wombasa. What you think you're going to get and what you don't get when you get what you want. Oh, yeah. Well, and see, now that's good. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something I, I, I somehow left out of this presentation that I usually say is that throughout the story, what your protagonist wants changes. They begin, they have a little want, a selfish want, something that they want for themselves. Luke wants Leia. But then when he meets her and he meets Han and he finds out what's really going on out there in the big giant empire that's being persecuted and stuck under the th thumb of the emperor, well, then he wants to help fight. He wants to get into the fight. Well, actually, originally in the very beginning, all he really wanted to do was fly. He wanted to get off the planet and go fly. Then the second thing he wanted was the girl. Then he wants to join the battle. Then he wants to win the battle. Throughout the story, what your hero, your protagonist wants will change. And every time it changes, it changes farther away from what he wants for himself and what he wants for everyone else. He wants, in the beginning, he wants just what he wants for himself. I wanna fly planes. I wanna get off this planet, I wanna fly. Then he wants something for somebody else. I wanna rescue the girl, she's in danger. Then he wants to help win the war. Every want changes and it always changes away from him. And that is another main difference between your protagonist and your antagonist. Your antagonist wants something, but his wants rarely ever change. He wants total domination. He wants to rule the world. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> he, wants, he, wants to, he wants everything for himself. It's always about what he wants and he always wants it for himself. And as the story progresses, he wants more and more and more, but he always wants more and more and more for himself. The protagonist wants more and more and more, but he wants it for other people. His wants start inward, start selfish and grow to expand everybody else. And the antagonist rarely ever changes. That's another way you can tell the good guy from the bad guy. The bad guy almost never changes except to get worse. He will get worse, but he, he never gets better. Now, I say that in Deadpool, um, Wade did get better. You know, he, he, but he's not the bad guy. He's the hero. He seems like a bad guy in the beginning. And you can do that. Your, your protagonist can seem like the bad guy in the beginning, but he's not really. But your antagonist, can seem like a good guy in the beginning, but he's not really. Sometimes it's really hard to tell these guys apart, especially if they want the same girl and the same prize. Any more questions? I have a question. So there's the writing novel version of Save the Cat. There like is. Brody. How does that differ? There is a novel version of Save the Cat. It's written by somebody else. It wasn't written by Blake Snyder. I don't like it as well. Okay. Now, it may be just as good, and it definitely has very 
uh, similar information and, and you know and a little more information about novels compared to scripts. Uh, I think probably one of the reasons I don't like it as well is because I read Blake Snyder's version first, and uh, I think the other the novel version is a poor copy. Say that in one line. <laughs> don't, I didn't say that. Shh. Can we erase that part? No, I, I don't like it as well. It's a perfectly good book. And um, and if you, you know, if, if you have a little bit of difficulty separating script from, from novel, you might want to read that book instead of the original one. But I like the Blake Snyder's copy or version. One of the things I found with Blake Snyder is that if I transport that into a novel, people would actually want things to happen earlier in the novel in terms of time to read. The movie is basically a long short story or a novella. The novel is about three times as much information. And so that's why I go, yeah, it works, but it doesn't work for 300 pages. It works for 100 pages. It does if you, and, and I did the math. I did the math for you on the, on, the, on the sheet. I did the math for you. If you, what happens on page five mm -hmm. of Blake's story script, yeah happens on 1520 of a book yes. and uh, yes a book is got has much more detail in it I think another reason I probably like the script version better is the, the fact that novels have a tendency to get bogged down and you've got to keep your pace moving and uh, when you're writing a story when you're writing a novel think of it as if you were watching it on the big screen, as if they were going to come in, buy this novel and turn it into a movie. Because if it's not fast paced enough, it'll never make it to the big screen. And it's really hard, really hard to convert a really slow, bogged down novel into a good movie. But also because your readers are wanting to be entertained. Your reader does not want to spend 40 pages reading about something that is boring or doesn't really have anything to do with what's really going on with the story. What, like I said earlier, that kind of novel was popular before 1950, but it's not popular now. Therein lies another thing. Who are you writing for? Now, pick an audience. Pick an audience and, and decide to write for that audience. And, and that doesn't mean everything you ever write has to be for the same audience. It means that book, pick an audience for that book. If you're writing for someone, a, an older audience that would appreciate that slow moving novel, then that's good. But if you're writing for the popular markets, if you're writing to try to sell this book to the readers that are buying books today, then it needs to be a faster paced novel. It has to be faster paced. There has to be something going on on every single page. And uh, because people get bored quick. I can't watch TV series when they're live, like where you have to wait next week to see the next episode because I get bored before next week. And then I forget that I was watching that particular show. And then I forget what, what I was watching, you know, what I don't even remember what that show was about. I have to wait until they come to Netflix or Hulu where they've got the whole entire series. And I mean, like if there's five, 10, 15 seasons, I gotta wait because I will get bored if I have to wait till next week to see what's going on, what happens next. And that's the way readers are. They get bored if they have to wait 40 pages to find out what happens next. I mean, it works for a lot of readers, yes. But in today's market, the faster paced books are, are the, well, they sell well. It's like why I write erotica. Erotica, there's a lot of things about erotica. Rom, uh, romance has to have a story. Romance, romance has to have a plot. Erotica just has to have a lot of porn. <laughs> a lot of porn. Erotica is porn for females, porn for women. And so it's gotta be fast paced, fast, fast, fast paced. And uh, they want it to be done. <laughs> wham, bam, thank you, bam. 
And that's the way readers are these days about anything. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. They want, they want to get in it. They want to know what's going on. They want to see what's happening. They want there to be, a, they want a lot of action and they want it to get over. They want to be able to sit down and read this, a book in a day. And uh, I can't read a book in a day. And, uh, but that's what readers want. Is this functional? Yes. Oh, um, for those of you who are at home and can't see this, uh, I have the outline step by step for you. I can send you a copy of this. On the back, this is a mind. Um, oh crap! Now I forgot the name. What you call a mind map? Basically, I do a lot of. Uh, I, I write stuff down. I make notes, make a lot of notes. I come up with an idea for a story and I do this thing where I just write down notes and they don't have to make any sense. They don't have to be in any order and they don't have to be used in the book. I'll come up with an idea and that'll lead me to another idea and, I'll, and I just write them on the back of the outline there and then I incorporate what I want to. And like I said, a lot of my stories come from dreams. So I'll have a lot of the idea to begin with. And so I write that down on there too, because I've got facts. Then when you go do some research and you look something up so you don't forget it, I like to have everything in one spot because I lose things. I'm very bad about losing things. So I condense things and put them in one spot. But, and I don't think the people out on, on TV, on the thing can see this. I also have this beautiful little thing it is the outline, what's on your sheet, it's the outline. When I come up with an idea, I write it down on a note, stick it in the pocket. I just, and keep track of it. And sometimes, you know, it may be six weeks between one pocket and another, you know. But when I actually finally start editing the book and organizing the book and putting the book into a readable structure, then I've got all these little notes in my pocket that I can include in the story or take out of the story, leave out of the story. Organization, even if you are a pantser, the more organized you are, the easier it is to complete the project and to come up with a finished project. Because basically, if you know the steps, if you know where you're going, if you know the end of the story, then all you have to do is figure out how to get there. And if you know the end of the story before you start writing, then you can figure out how to get to the end. But if you don't know the end, you're going to get lost somewhere in the middle. Now, you don't always have to know the end at the beginning. When you first start writing, you might just start with an idea like I do. And you might just start writing stuff down. But at some point before you actually send that story out, to be published, you've got to get organized. You have to, because publishers don't want a mess. They want organization. <laughs> and uh, you say your, your first draft can be just as crazy, wild, sloppy as you want. I mean, throw anything and everything in that first draft. The first draft is strictly for you. It should never be seen by anybody else, ever ever. No, do not. Your critique group should not see it. Your beta readers should not see it. Your mother should not see the first draft. In fact, the first draft should be quickly destroyed as soon as you have a readable draft ready. Because if you get famous, then somebody someday is going to go through all your papers and they're going to look at your first drafts and they're going to go, oh my gosh, how did this person ever get anything printed? And the reason and the way and the how is because they organized before they published. You do not have to be organized in the first draft. Forget about it for the first draft. The first draft can be just as disorganized as, as you need it to be for your comfort zone. But the final draft must have structure. It must be organized. I if it's, have any first drafts already. 
They were, I, well, yeah, I, I've got tons of first drafts and a lot of them never became second drafts. But the first draft, it doesn't matter how disorganized it is. The final draft must be organized. Your final draft should be as perfect as you can make it on your own before you send it to an editor. And then you should send it to an editor, a beta reader, beta reader, beta reader, before you send it to a publisher. By the time you send something out to a professional editor, a professional publisher, a professional agent, it should be almost perfect. They should almost have no, nothing to change by the time you actually send it to an actual professional publisher. I, I read that, well, Stephen King's book said that you have to have it exactly as you want it. Yes, it should be. Before you actually send your, a copy of your work to a publisher or a professional editor or agent, it should be exactly the way you want it to appear when it's in print, but it has to be perfect as far as grammar and technical and organization and structure and spelling and format. It has to be as perfect as possible. The less the editor and agent and publisher have to do, the better the chance you have of selling that book. Now I'll tell you a nightmare story about an author who pitched a book, sold a book on the pitch, had not written a word. <laughs> not a word. Got a huge advance. Huge advance. A six-figure advance. Had not written a word of the story. Now this was not a famous author. This was not a Stephen King. This was not somebody big name that you go, oh yeah, we'll print whatever you send us, Stephen. You know, I don't care if it's 4,000 words long. <laughs> I mean, 4,000 pages long. Yeah, 4,000 words is nothing for Stephen. I don't care if it's 4,000 pages long. We will print it because it's got your name on it. No, this was not one of those authors. They spent this money. They wrote a contract for three books, but did a three book deal. Not a single word had been written. The writer couldn't write. <laughs> they got the first book. The editor went, oh my gosh, we've spent all this money. It's going to fail. It's going to cost us. We're going to lose every penny. And they put it on the market exactly the way it was sent. Why? Because... If you've already spent $700,000 on a really bad book, you're not going to invest another hundred or 200000 on an editor for that really bad book. And if it's a really bad book, it's going to take $100,000, $200,000 for an editor to make it into a good book. An editor's job is to take what you give them and make it better. So if you give them the best possible work you can do, maybe they don't have as much work today. But another thing the editor does is they see the holes that you can't see. When you're writing, you know what the story's supposed to say. You know what's supposed to be on the page and you're close to it and you love it and you cherish every single little word of it and you don't want to cut a single one. So an editor has to be there to go, ah, nope, that does not work. Nope. Get rid of that or add this because, hey, guess what? It's 45 pages in and you haven't told us the main character's name yet. <laughs> Any more questions? Because I think I've probably gone way beyond my time limit, haven't I? Well, five minutes over. But, um, <laughs> Not nearly as bad as I thought. No, no, no questions. I'm, I'm, I'm way out of my comfort zone because, yikes, yeah, 30 years ago, my daughter that I made up the bedtime stories for them myself. And I've been at it for about two years now, writing them and trying to become a writer instead of just a really good storyteller that puts kids to sleep in less than five minutes. <laughs> you never had to finish a story, did you? <laughs> That's all you need to put on your advertisement for the patient. For the, for the you know, here's the, yeah, yeah, if you tell the parent, if you put on the ad, 
Guaranteed to put your child, to put any child to sleep in five minutes. No matter how much of a bouncer a five-year-old boy is, if I start telling him about the bears in Alaska where I grew up, I've never been to Alaska. <laughs> that kid was asleep in less than two minutes. Well, you know that he's made of he's a rubber ball. A rubber ball. You know they say to write what you know. And, but that's not necessary. Write what you can find out about. And uh, if you can research it, you can write it. Mm -hmm. Now, I write science fiction and paranormal ro romance and fantasy. So that means I can make this stuff up. I can make an awful lot of it up. If you write science fiction, if you include something that is science, it, you better get the science right. But, you don't have to get all the science right because you create the science for your world. You just stick to what works in your world. You make it clear, this is what works in, my, in your world. I had a fantasy story that had electricity in it and uh, I got a remark back from a judge that said, there wasn't any electricity in this time. Eh, there is in my world. So what there are swords and, and dragons and, and there's still electricity in this world. It's my world and I put electricity in it. So, but you have to make sure that the reader understands that these laws of physics work in your world. Yeah. And, uh, but now on the storytelling to the kids, that's a great way to start out, you know, because, you, man, you've got a foundation. You've already got stories. My granddaughter is five years old. And the other day, we, she loves to call and chat on, chat on Facebook, on FaceTime. She likes to call and for me to sit and watch her play. We'll do that for an hour. She'll be playing and every now and then she'll say, Nanny, see this? What I'm doing here? Oh yeah, honey, that's great. I'm, I'm typing away, but you know, I'm spending time with her on FaceTime. Five-year-old. She told me a story the other day. She had a little notebook she opened the little notebook up. She's reading from that notebook like she's really reading words on a page. There's nothing on that page. First of all, she can't really read that much. She can read a few words, sight words. She didn't really read that much. She says she wrote this story. She don't really write that much. Although she can tell you a good story. She starts the story from the beginning. She tells the entire story. There's conflict, there's adventure, there's excitement, there's heroes. Everything that you have on the little Pixar story thing and in the right order. Five years old. She finishes reading the story to me and I'm going, okay, honey, is this a story that you've read so often you, or that somebody's read to you so often you remember the story? No, Nini, I made it up just now. I said, is it based on a TV show that you've watched in the past? No, Nini, I just now made it up. And I'm going, I'm giving up writing because I can't do it. <laughs> this child is a genius. She got the story correct all the way through. And it doesn't matter when you start and it doesn't matter when you quit as long as you don't give up. Always keep plugging. Uh, Laura Inglewild was 65 years old when her first novel was published. Now she wrote stories and she wrote newspaper. She was a journalist. But her first book, 65 years old when her first book was published, she wrote that book when she was 20, but it didn't get published until she was 65. Stephen King, Carrie was turned down, rejected 30 times. He had quit, he'd given up hope. He threw it in the trash and his wife pulled it out of the trash and sent it to another publisher and they accepted it. So don't ever give up, no matter how long it takes. Uh, and keep, the, pra practice makes perfect. Uh, I read somewhere that you have to write a million words to actually get one good one. So, hey, <laughs> keep writing till you find that good work. Yeah. And then, then you can start selling. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't sell bad stories. No, okay, I take that back. I have a lot of stories out there that I have sold that I go back and look at them now and I go, oh, that is so bad. 
how did I ever sell that? That publisher loved me <laughs> because you get better as you go. Nobody is good at anything when they start. It takes years and years of practice. You cannot become a doctor overnight. You can't wake up at 16 and go, I'm going to be a doctor and go, and go do surgery the next day. That's not how it works. And it's the same thing with writing. You can't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a writer, write your first book and sell it for a million bucks. Although it has been done on more than one occasion. Yes, huh? yeah. yes. They yes. that is not the real world. That is fantasy. That is high fantasy. All right, any more questions? Because I know I've talked way too long now. If if I if somebody doesn't make me, I never shut up. Okay. Okay. All right. I've given up. <laughs> I've given up. Don't give up. Telling my own life story because I've met with people and meet with them. Then will believe. Oh, they, they won't believe. I promised my parents that I would not write my own life story as long as they are either one of them are still alive. <laughs> and, uh, people actually have called me a liar. And I actually was still You know what? I tell people this all the time. I'm a writer. I get paid to lie. <laughs> yeah, I get paid to make shit up. I've met people. <laughs> I tell that story too. And they say, Oh, here's a phone book. <laughs> that that's a bestseller right there. If it's unbelievable, it's a bestseller. All right, I'm I'm gonna walk away so Amy, Amy can take over. Do I need to do anything? Here? I'm just gonna close it real quick and then call the recording and we're good to go. All right, thanks everyone for joining online. And uh, we're gonna make this recording available later this afternoon once I get home and get it uploaded. Uh, and we'll share that link to Facebook. So thank you for coming. If you have any um, news, announcements, anything like that, please be sure to post that on Facebook or send it in to um, Inez for the next uh, newsletter. So thank you everyone, bye. <laughs> I'm going to stop the share. I'm currently